Hello, this is Jeff again at the top of the show. I hope you are all well. Before we get into this week's episode, I just want to remind everyone that this was recorded the day after a pandemic was declared in relation to COVID-19. So just a little context for this, we decided to push it out a little bit more. Uh, and since then, a lot of things have changed in terms of the show. We're uh, pretty active right now on Facebook Live, so I'd encourage you to check that out. We're popping in every now and then, but we do have a scheduled time to meet Every Sunday at 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, we're going to be doing a Facebook Live right now. It's Rajiv and myself, and we had a great time this last Sunday, so we encourage you to check that out. And we have something else coming up that we're very excited about on our Facebook Live platform as we're kind of working through this pandemic together. We are going to be starting something called Continuing the Conversation. And basically every Monday following a new episode that posts. So you're going to be hearing this episode on April 21st, 2020, the following Monday, which is April 27th, 2020, at 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, we're going to be doing something called Continuing the Conversation. So this is going to be an opportunity for us to kind of address the episode that just came out. So we're going to give you opportunities to come on and ask questions about that ep episode, give some insights that you had from listening to the episode, anything related to that particular content. So we're going to kind of make it an official after show. And what we're going to do is we're going to take the audio from that Facebook Live and we're going to put it on the feed. So it'll be a bonus episode between episodes to kind of follow up like an after show or a post show kind of thing. So we are excited about that. We're going to see how it goes. We're not committing to do this long term, but we know that during this time in particular, it's important for us to, to stay connected with y'all. So uh, be on the lookout for that. That's going to be the first first Monday after this episode airs. Uh, it'll be on Facebook Live, and then the next day or the day after, it will be on our podcast feed. So check our show notes, irenicast.com slash 165, or the show notes of any other episode, or just go straight to our right website, irenicast.com. And there you'll find all the ways you can connect with us and all that. So we hope that you are all doing well. And since I, this is the second week in a row that I have put a little uh, announcement at the head of the show, I want to make sure that we do not miss out on a cold open for this week. So here is our cold open into the episode on truth. I have been naked in a pickup truck. Hello, everyone, and welcome. We are Irenicast. I'm Jeff. I'm Alan. I'm Bonnie. I'm Casey. And this is Rajiv. On the first and third Tuesday of every month, we bring to you our perspectives on theology and culture from a post-evangelical lens. Thank you for joining us for another conversation to provoke your progressive Christian imagination. This week, what in the hell is going on? Uh, we are recording this after the announcement of uh, the coronavirus or the COVID-19 virus. Uh, Go, going pandemic. Going pandemic, events canceled, all kinds of stuff going on. And we had scheduled on the docket to talk about truth. And for our segment, we're going to be doing a segment called Two Truths and a Lie. So we're, we're sticking on brand with this one, uh, but we're a little bit disoriented and as well as I'm sure that a lot of us are as we're kind of filtering through what this means for us, what this means for our family, what this means for our loved ones, what this means for our country and all of that kind of stuff. So I don't know. So we're, we're just going to, we're just going to move forward and talk about truth and we hope to give us all things to think about. And I I'm stammering obviously because we're, you know, we're trying to come up with the the right transition on how to move forward with this, but I think we have a good conversation, a good episode this week and uh we're hopeful. Hopefully you've all seen Casey's beautiful face on our thoughtful Thursdays uh keeping us up to date on all things Irenicast. So So yeah, so we'll get into some of that later, but let's just kind of get right into the conversation. I think the word truth uh, for those of us that are coming out of fundamental backgrounds, evangelical backgrounds, has a lot of baggage attached to it. So let's let's start there. Let's start with with kind of how the the word truth makes us feel and how it's evolved for us, and and kind of encapsulate that truth journey. I guess would be a good way to say it. Who wants to Who wants to jump in there and stop me from talking? Well, I, Jeff, you mentioned stammering right now. I think stammering is always the place to start when you talk about truth, right? Amen. It's a, it's a, right. um, 
like to have even have this conversation, I think it's important to bring a, a sort of humility to the conversation because um, who's to say, who's to say uh, what is truth and and uh, you know we can talk about truth, but then there's all the the decide this. The, we also have to talk about who are the deciders and who's left out of that out of the conversation um, when the decisions are made about what we call truth and what we don't call truth. So that's what I'm thinking about as we start this conversation. I had a friend who heard that we're going to record this episode and they said they wanted to take bets on how often the word capital T truth, the phrase capital T truth would be said in this conversation. I'm going to go with at least twice. (laughs) I I think for all those that are um, hiding out at home, uh, trying to stay you know, safe from the virus, uh, you should bring out your bottle of tequila. And anytime we say truth, you should have to drink. Oh capital capital T tequila. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Are you going to create that and sell it in the merch store? <laughs> <laughs> We've already devolved into a drinking game. All right. <laughs> this, is, well, I think this, this, this shows how like how disoriented we actually are yeah. right we're right. starting yeah, with we, the segment it, this is this is a yeah this is a complicated time and a complicated topic and you know it's weird because i i was starting seminary when i was still atheist agnostic because i felt like the christian story was central enough to the fabric of our society that it needs a lot of different perspectives in it to to cope with it in one way or another. And one of the theology classes we took uh, was from the Jesuit school. And the very first class, the professor is like, and, and the book that we were reading, is basically like, just know that you need to approach speaking about God or truth with the utmost reverence, because as soon as you open your mouth, you're committing blasphemy. So it needs to be done with a lot of deep reflection and a humility in that, you know, and, and this is coming from the Jesuits who who could learn a thing or two about humility historically, for sure. But um, I think that's a powerful posture in in relation to conversation about truth is things that we might hold deeply, deeply true for ourselves That's us. And as much confidence as we have in it, I think approaching it with humility, with deep reflection before we offer it as here's something that holds fast over time. I I agree with you, Rajiv. I often, uh, when I talk to young people about truth, I will say, how many of you have tried to have a conversation with a toddler? You know, a lot of times they're just babbling away. Their eyes are bright and big. Um, and they're so excited to tell you the story that you cannot understand. And in the same way, I feel like that's so much of our language about truth and God, right? It's uh, We're babbling to the infinite. And it's cute and beautiful and engaging. You know, there's a humility that we need to to hold on to. Absolutely. Yeah. But, you know, on the other side of that, though, we often will tell young people, to claim their truth and to, you know, to discover their truth, to be on this quest of discovery um, and claim it and name it and share it. Um, And I'd love to hear, you know, like, how do, does that just sort of collapse this idea of truth into sort of individual expressions of truth? My, in terms of my own evolution of under thinking about truth is that I think I began, I was taught that there's this capital T truth. So you get one, Rajiv. Um, And that we all, you know, God is the holder of that. And that we are all, we see, you know, through the glass darkly, whatever this truth is. And our whole purpose of existence is to continue to search and understand and become more knowledgeable about that truth. But in the evolution of my own faith journey and spiritual path, I've come to, you know, that that has fallen away from me completely. But this idea of having my own truth is very attractive. And I'm not sure um, 
I don't know if that just puts me like at the center of the world. And that is problematic in and of itself. I'd love to hear what you all think. I think even for for people who don't really skew toward the religious side of things and maybe feel a little more um, inclined to put their their eggs in the basket of science or humanism, I think that can happen on that side of things too, as if the world or the scientific uh, quest has this solid truth to give. And really all it is, is a matter of seeing appropriately like the, there's different theories involved with all of these, like the correspondence theory being, if you can just like see what the world is correctly, then you'll have the truth. You'll know what the truth is. That's coming unraveled for a lot of people. So whether, whether the, Number two, capital T truth is coming from your church or from God. And all you have to do is kind of just understand it or whether it's coming from observations of the physical world. It's like this. We're thinking of truth as if it's this possessive object, like it's a like it's a horse or a house or like something that you can kind of own. And what we're discovering in both theological world and the scientific world is that it's way more complicated than that. At the base of reality, there's something that you just – there is um, – there's an uncertainty that you can't get past as as human beings. You can't know uh, everything. And that's not to say that we don't, you know, believe in science or trust the, the, the scientific method, things like that, which is really important. It's just kind of a shifting consciousness in my mind about what the nature of tr- – what even the word truth means um, for us. So less of an object – probably more of a process, at least for me. And uh, so, yeah, I, I mean, of, of course, God thinking about God is so big. I'm more like, like I, I want to have the conversation of like, how do I even know what's true in front of me? <laughs> you know, and like, what, where are there competing ideas of what the world is? And even in my own life, I've noticed like in my thinking, when something shifts, my world shifts, my interpretation of the world shifts. And when you you treat truth as if it was, a physical object to be owned, then you have people who don't have it and then you're giving it to other people. And you're that process, I think supports things like colonialism and power and oppression. All of us grew up being told that there was a capital T truth. Right. And, um, and we all remember moments where we, had that inner like i don't know i don't know but then we also did the shake it off like eh, just you know shake off those doubts uh your your disbelief is a problem blah 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 like do you have any memory of what it was like to break through that initial kind of impulse to shake it off to shake off the questions and then move into this process that we're talking about I think for me, Rajiv, it, it came with like it literally being my life. Like I like it was either live into the stuff that they told me was the truth and believe that God hated me or or find another way. And I think that for some people like that's for many of us like coming to a place of having to no longer just shake it off but actually turn around and confront it. It was at a moment when we had to really uh, choose the path, right? Whether to continue to buy into these oppressive models or begin to claim our own lives, our own capital T truth, like Bonnie was talking about, like the things that that didn't feel right in our being that were that were being told to us, and then helping us to navigate that. I I remember them saying like the truth of the Bible. That's what they'd say, right? It's the truth of the Bible, and if they can't hear the truth of the Bible, then tell them with your lives. But what happens when your life is conflicting with what they are telling you the Bible is saying, right? I think that's where the rub the rub came for me anyway. Like everything in me that was giving me life, they were telling me is the the path that was leading me to hell. For me, I don't think it was so much that truth was presented as, which I do have a problem with, and I think it's certainly an element or a large element of it, of what you're talking about, Alan, of that, that truth is this thing to be had. It wasn't so much that as it was that it was presented 
as simple that any kind of complexity would lead you away from the truth. And it was like, here's the truth. I can sum it up in one sentence and you have to accept that. So as, as the complexity of life began to hit me, as the complexity of ministry began to hit me, as the complexity of my situation compared to someone else's situation began to be analyzed through that lens, it, it didn't make any sense anymore. How can we present truth in such simple terms when everything is complex and that leaves you no room. So you feel like if you're sitting in any kind of paradox, if you're sitting in any kind of doubt that you're far away from truth. And I think that that's one of the most abusive things that anyone can do is to present any kind of truth as a matter of fact, you believe the fact anything that you experience other than the fact is wrong. And it, it did, a lot of damage in, in my own internal life, because anytime I had a doubt, anytime I had a question, anytime I was presented with any kind of complexity, especially within scripture or the church, uh, I was wrong. I was overthinking it. You're both kind of saying the, the same thing. And that is that you were, you were not brought in on the process of truth making or truth bearing or whatever word we want to use for it. If truth isn't something to be owned, then it is a process at which we arrive, I think together. And you can't have just one side of the equation. Like when you speak at someone, they're actually listening and, and taking in. And, and even in the act of listening, you have something to offer. And the places we came from disrespected us as agents of meaning of meaning making and, I know that like, it's just so weird. It's so hard for me to talk about. Bonnie and I had a conversation recently where we're like, it's, you know, I've, I've, our shifting ideas of what truth is are behind a lot of, a lot of what we do and a lot of like spiritual growth that at least I'm going through. And it's kind of difficult to articulate, but, uh, I found, uh, the Catherine Keller's book that Bonnie recommended to be really good. And she set up this dichotomy of on the one side, you have absolute truth which would be the church or the government or something like that, giving you this absolute truth. And on the other side, you have dissolution, dissolute truth, which is there is no truth, none. You just like the shrug of Pontius Pilate or the shrug of someone like, Hey, nothing's true. And in the middle you have like the resolute. And that is where Casey, you as a human being are brought into the conversation with whoever's talking to you or, or Jeff, the complexity of your life is brought in. And through those conversations and perspectives, you do arrive at something and it is kind of like more solid than it is not solid. You know, it does have a bearing and an impact on our life. I wouldn't set it up in like a metaphysical quality that it applies to everybody everywhere, but it is something important to speak and to know. So listening to voices that are, uh, that are various or listening to the complexity of our own life is a way of, of arriving at a truth. So that's, I think that's one part of the conversation that's interesting to me. And and I would say, um, and and I love that, Alan, and I completely respect Catherine Keller's approach to this idea of truth. But I would also, add, I mean, my own experience and not and study has led me to believe that truth you can't ever arrive at truth, even through this process of co creating and everybody contributing to the conversation. Because at least I think that at the very most fundamental, basic, maybe even simple, which I know is going to maybe jump, rub you wrong, Jeff, but it, it's this idea that at the very bottom of all of it, truth changes truth. Truth is change. And so accepting that uncertainty that you're talking about, Alan, is like fundamental to even beginning, I think, to put together a construct. Because I do think we have to have constructs. And maybe yes. that's where the resolution, that's, that's, what, what, I, that's what you're talking mm -hmm. about, yeah. in order to operate. Or we'll just stay in bed all day long. Like, or, we, or we won't listen to the expert, the medical advice experts right. of people who are paying attention to public health. Uh, yeah, there, there are important actionable items that I wouldn't call capital T truth, but more resolute, right. okay. hard fought. So before we, we move on with this, I think it, it, this is soon going to get this convoluted mess of everyone <laughs> using the word truth with a different meaning. And then those of you that are listening, having to interpret, well, when Jeff says truth, he means this. And when yeah. Alan 
and short of putting an entire personal glossary in the show notes, let's uh, let's I, pause I, for a second. Well, I just want to say for all those people on Twitter who say it sounds like we smoke a bunch of weed before we uh, start these this show, <laughs> this this is like the best example of that, right? Like, like us sitting around talking about truth man you know what i mean like, <laughs> you know just... i think it's important i mean it's no it, i totally do but i just I go yeah that's true you're right it does sound it does sound like we're crazy and that's because it kind of is a crazy conversation to have uh but every time i go to like a family reunion someone comes up to me and it's like what's your relationship with truth and like you know i got this like truth is just such a huge conversation for so many people but it does look weird from a certain angle Totally why, right. why am I not seeing those tweets? <laughs> yeah, yeah, there w- there was one that I saw that was like, it sounds like these these guys all sit around and get high before they have a conversation or something like that. Or it was like, this reminds me of when I was in college getting high, oh, yeah. uh, sitting that. with my friends or something. Yeah. Well, yeah, right. And, and that's okay. fine. That's always going to be interpretation because we're trying to create a space here where questions and exploration is fine and being able to find to sit in that uh you know, not the the physical haze of whatever we're some of us may be smoking, but the <laughs> the theoretical haze of <laughs> whatever is happening. But getting back to this whole idea of truth, let's let's kind of not that we can define it here, not that we're going to solve the world problems. We're still a couple years away from that here on Irenicast. Um So I was just I was just joking. I don't know if anyone everyone just deadpan like that. Oh no, that's true. Yeah, I um, love that. <laughs> uh, so when when we we speak about truth, obviously, and correct me if I'm wrong, as I kind of try to recap as we move forward, uh, we we were presented a lot of us, or all of us, here on this show, and then many of our listeners probably were presented with the idea of truth is that this this thing to be obtained that comes from God, and we'll get into what you mentioned before earlier, Bonnie, about well who decided those truths, because that's, that's an important part of this conversation that we need to get to. And now when we're talking about truth, we go from a capital T truth where there's this something to be attained where now we're saying we're, we're giving another, you know, you know, prefix or that's a truth, a truth. So are there multiple truths? So when we talk about truth, are we talking about a fact? Are we talking about an experience? Are we talking about something that is even tangible or could it be related to how we speak about God, where everything we say about truth is a shadow of what it really is. And none of us will ever understand or approach what it really is. And then the final question, it does truth even exist? Yes, I think it does. And that sounds kind of weird, but like, I think it's, there are multiple truths because for me, it's a process and a framing. Like what is truth, Alan, to you? I would say it's a convergence of earnestness. <laughs> it's a convergence of like, no, for, for real, I, I think I know what's not truth. And that is when people make bad faith claims that hurt other people for their own interest. I know what lying is. And so on the other side of that, we have people who are honest and earnest and they're bringing themselves and they're allowing other people to come into the conversation to look at something together. That's not to say that we can actually construct reality in a completely faithful way. I mean, we're very limited beings in this universe, and our perspective is not a full one. And this is what I find really interesting is like human consciousness is like a flashlight. You shine it on something, and the darkness around it gets darker. We think that like in our scientific process or theological process, truth just grows. Like the, the amount of truth we hold can grow and grow, but but it's not quite like that. Like there's it's interesting to me to think that like our ignorance grows just as much as our quote unquote truth does. So for me, truth is a convergence of people and uh, coming together to analyze their context and to speak their experience. And that sounds like maybe really hippie or something, (laughs) but I think that that applies in the scientific realm as much as it does in the theological. And I, I could talk about theories of why I think that way, but that's that's where I'm at. Like when you talk about a situation of something that happened, the way you frame that is uh like what it means what actually happened because you're you're paying attention to some parts of it but not others like when you're studying the effects of cigarettes on a society you're leaving out things whenever you say something so to to get all of the context is this process and this framing 
And it happens for anything that we do. I think Ellen, that's, that's that where is I'm at. the most on brand answer. <laughs> what? for you <laughs> just in terms of the, the, the way that you center it like i think that the, the way that you uh approach the world with such earnestness the way that you deeply deeply care for the well-being of others and i think that that's really emblematic of maybe what we're all taught and I don't, again i don't want to assume anyone but maybe emblematic of what we're all talking about when it comes to truth is that it 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 is a truth it's a perspective on the world and that that when we say the word truth you know are, are, in a way are we just saying like this is this is a truth because it's my truth because it's how i see the world right now and it's why we feel like truth changes so much is because the way that we view the world changes so much and that's why truth seems so elusive because we're expecting truth to be universalized to everyone else when maybe it was never intended to be and that it was just something for us to hold on to in seasons of our life to be able to cope and move on to the next thing. I think that's totally, Jeff, that's so well said. I think that's exactly the experience of, I think that's the nature of truth. You summed it up really well. There has to be, I think, like you're saying, it, truth, we want truth to be eternal in some way, because I think then we feel like we're sort of plugged into something transcendent beyond ourselves, and that is very comforting. However, human lives and human experience is not really eternal. It is it is collectively, when we put all of us together, there's something that continues and abides throughout. And when I say throughout, I, I mean in this beyond sense. And I think truth, there are many truths in relationship. It just feels very relational to me. And that somehow when all of our, when we speak our truth, which is the words that we say about what's real to us, and, and that changes. I think that changes. I mean, if you live a life, every day is different. Your experience is different. You're constantly incorporating new things into your experience, which then creates new language for what how you would speak to that experience about what's real to you and real for you and through you. And when we put all of those words together and throughout all the moments of time, <clears throat> perhaps then we can begin to say, hmm, maybe that's truth. But who can do that? You know, you use that word eternal and, and it just sparks this question in my mind. Can anything be eternal that doesn't change? And the more I think about it, I don't think that you can be. It can't be fixed or right. static. But yet truth is presented that way all the time. But can't it, but can it be eternal? Can there be a thread? That's good. Now I feel like what Casey's talking about, I'm like, yeah, totally. I feel this. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think one of our shortcomings, I mean, language language enables a lot of things and inhibits a lot of things. And, you know, we, we know this more more readily about the word love. Like, oh, uh, that's just, that's a, it doesn't encompass it. You know, we, we have an impossible time defining love. I think truth is similar. It's like, eh, it's just so big and our language around it is, is, um, puts limits on on the full meaning of what truth is and um and and maybe we try too hard at concretizing some of this uh in order to feel better about it and and the challenge you know kind of what Al, what we've all talked about in different ways is is embracing the malleability of things that are so deep that they can't be crystallized. Maybe I, I can't help but think of, of all these conversations. I do identify as a humanist and a Christian, and it's really easy for me to get into the frame of mind of looking at it from the eyes of like a scientist or something. And I just wonder like scientific discoveries, laws, things like that, like how crystal, how crystal are they? I know they're changing and refining but maybe, and, and you said concretizing, like 
we are building stuff. Like we wouldn't have satellites if it wasn't for a very powerful truth of relativity that we like discovered in the in the laws of physics. And maybe those quote unquote even scientific truths are far more human and malleable than we realize. Though while everyone was talking, I was just thinking like truth is kind of like breath. Like you have to take it in. You have to breathe it in. It doesn't mean you could take one big breath and then never have to do it again. And it's you know it's going to change and be different. But we build our lives with it. And in the context of church, I wonder like what con what concrete concepts do we need to make concrete to to, to support what we're doing. And what is it that we're doing with with the ideas that that we need to be concrete? If I thought too hard about certain physical laws, I'd never be able to do some of the amazing things that we do with technology. You know, if, if we sat and, and, and theorized about how some of our theories like are not as solid as we think they are, we wouldn't have the amazing advances we've had. And then in the terms of church, I think like there's a lot of people operating right now who are pastors or just regular people going to church. And they're thinking like, if I think too hard about the nature of God or the nature of the Bible or the nature of, of Christ, then my worship is going to be hindered because I'm exploring this stuff. I'm unpacking it. I'm thinking about it. And instead just making these concrete, like, like ideas and just accepting them allows me to do something with them. So I, I think maybe there's a way to look at back at all of it and just say, what are we doing with our quote unquote truth? And like, what is worth unpacking? For all of us, we we went down the road of of pulling things apart to some degree. And for some of us, that like ruined our livelihood. And I think all of us would say it was worth it. You know, I don't know where I'm going with this, but I was just that word concrete really hit me. It's like we do need truth, but it doesn't mean that it's necessarily concrete. We have to treat it as if it was concrete to do things in our lives. Well, I, I wonder, you know, if we conflate sometimes uh, facts, like empirical facts with truth. And for me, they're two very different things. I was just going to say Alfred North Whitehead, he has this um, phrase he uses all the time. Uh, Alfred North Whitehead is the one of the forerunners of process theology. And he's, he, he says, he calls these things stubborn facts, you know, and stubborn facts are things that, they have staying power and they're useful, but they should never be equated with truth. He also says there are no such things as whole truths, only half truths. And when we try to work with half truths as if they are whole truths, we play the devil. Totally. <laughs> totally. See, this is why I showed up to this episode. <laughs> I need to think about that. Totally. That's right. I need a lunchbox with that on it. You know what? The the first word in that the first word in that series is way. That's a process that is not necessarily a, a, a quantitative particle. Saying I am the way is saying I identify with the process that is truth. That's what way literally means. And so maybe well, that's and, where we need to unpack it and and back it up one word. I am. I mean the whole the I am construct in in mystical language is its own entity, which isn't particularly scientific or factual. So that leads us to that phrasing is taken as a fact, right? Look at how many times has it been presented to you as read it. It says right there, I am the truth, the way, the life. That's what it is. You can't deny it. Right. But that doesn't take into account the many layers of context. It wasn't originally written in language, so you can't in our language, so you can't do that. I mean, all the stuff that we talk about when we're talking about interpreting the Bible and the layers of, you know, cultural appropriation that have that have been t- piled on top of it since the since those words were penned or spoken or whatever. And I think that this all goes back to people who are standing on the truth or a truth or however you want to do it goes back to what Bonnie mentioned at the beginning of this conversation is that how do we determine what the truth is? And who was the decider of what that ultimate truth was? Because I think that we have this, you know, when you talk about this idea of, you know, facts and truth, I I think of libertarianism. That's just where my mind goes, where it's this, you take the facts of, well, yeah, if you do this, then this is the outcome and everyone else is going to do that. But it doesn't take into account the account of the truth of social disparity and poverty and racism and all these other institutions. It, It assumes this blank slate where two plus two equals four. 
And I think that we apply that a lot of times to religion. The more power you tend to have and the more influence you tend to have in a given society or a given context, the easier it is for you to simplify and universalize. Well, you just do this and it's easy and everything happens. So so when when we speak of, of truth, I think it is important for us to talk about, for many people, who the deciders of that truth have have been, because I think it's presented as facts equal truth. And I, I think that that's, that's the pseudo intellectualism that we see a lot in spaces that typically come from straight white males, you know, guys like on both sides of the fence, Bill Maher, you know, uh, Joe Rogan, you know, Rush Limbaugh, these guys that are, or what's that, that other guy's name? The, um, I don't know. There's a lot of them out there, but these, you know, they say, well, no, this is the way it is. This is fact. And then how do we maneuver through that as we kind of deconstruct who's given us the authority on what truth is and what facts are whatever. That that reminds me of uh, Terrence McKenna, who said, if you don't at least occasionally contradict yourself, your position isn't nearly complex enough. Yes, that's a good one. I never heard that before. Yeah, you're talking about simplifying things. And again, denying framing, denying the framing process being like you're saying the libertarian move or something. We, we talked about that in the show in a lot of different episodes. And I think it, it'd be worth going back through and, and listening to our episodes on the Bible. Yeah. Maybe I'll step back and then we can have that conversation about who, who simplifying things serves. But as you were speaking, like something came to me and it was it's like, you almost want to find that sweet spot between complexifying everything and then acting on the stuff, you know, you know, like somewhere right in the middle is like, hey, here are some things like I know compassion's good. And so in the morning, I will do these like rituals that are actually pretty simplistic and I don't question them to some degree. I just do them and it changes me. But at the same time, I hold it lightly knowing that the world is complex. And so I, maybe that tension between the two is where is where we can evaluate all of our different experiences. Like how much complexity could your your background uh, hold and stand. And then also at the same time, like slipping into dissolution and saying every nothing matters is frankly, frankly, what, what, uh, I know we can't go one episode without talking about Trump, but like when he speaks, that's what I hear. It's like, everybody's lying. Nothing's true. Nothing matters. That kills people and it kills our spirit. So like somewhere in the middle between those two things. I, I wonder too about like asking, in holding this truth, how does this affect my neighbor? I can have an opinion or whatever. I can hold on to something that I think is true. But if it if it doesn't hold up for my neighbor or if it puts my neighbor's life at jeopardy or it devalues people, then is this truth worth holding on to? Or is it true at all? I think that's one of the biggest problems with truth telling, as you were talking about earlier, Jeff, um, who is offering these truths to us, these not capital T truths. <laughs> like, I think that it's it's essential that that when we are navigating what is truth and what is not, that we keep before us, how do these opinions or these ideas impact the people uh, that surround us? And what does it mean to them or for them? You know, I think that's like and and when you do that, Casey, then things become complex all of a sudden. Very complex. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. But yeah. And then it makes me wonder, like, or it makes me me think, you know, why truth? Like it, it like if even if we step back a little bit further and and we thought about like why is it so important for people to hold on to facts as reality and not accept that they can shift or reject it all which i think is the, another side of the same coin basically it's still sort of an absolutism like either absolute truth or absolute untruth that like there is no truth then then i i mean i can't come to the conversation without thinking about human development and I just wonder, you know, like you can see the process of a child growing up where how truth changes during that process and how like young children, it's very black and white. It's very concrete. Like it's either this way or it's that way. 
it's very hard to for them to be able to hold the capacity to 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 keep it complex until you know time goes by and conversations happen and experiences happen and then little by little as they integrate more and more um, we as humans begin to be able to think in more complex ways. But I don't think that's true for, I think that not everyone's on a path. I mean, this might be, sound really condescending. I don't not know everyone's about that. Don't go of, there. I've no, already No, wait pissed. a second. Because <laughs> of choice, we have agency. Yeah. yeah. We have agency in choosing whether or not I am going to do what Casey <laughs> suggests, which is yeah. think, well, how does my truth, how does holding this truth affect my neighbor? That's yeah. a choice that we can make. And if we don't make those choices, then do we develop? That's what I'm asking. And is is the destiny of every human being to develop in that process is like, I want to say that's my truth is that everybody is on that path. But you're right. Maybe some people are not. And that sounds kind of elitist saying it. But like, if those children don't have concrete truths, they don't live. Do you, do you know exactly. what I mean? Like, like they'll walk into the street when it's not okay and not safe to walk into the street. And then as you get older, is it sometimes okay to walk in the street? Absolutely. And, and under certain circumstances, the kid would. But we need those truths. To, n not like boots. That's that's another thing. There's a theory of truth saying that you just bootstrap to truth. Like you just kind of add up as many as you can that are actually pragmatic and work for you to create like a bigger truth. That's an interesting thing. Right. But that that takes agency too. And, and just keep in mind, there are flat earthers and anti-vaxxers. And so be it. I mean, that's that's part of the hu so humanity. It. I mean, like, it's Ugh. okay. There are also Nazis. I mean, like, there are people who actually yeah. believe that they are su there supreme are. because of their perspective. Right. And they shouldn't be allowed to harm anybody else. But, you know, if you want to be an idiot, I mean, be an idiot. Just leave other people alone. Being <laughs> blind to those, the reality of how our human siblings move in the world, I mean, that doesn't necessarily... Yeah. That's add true. anything right uh, yeah i think yeah i think it's right so i i, I i'm linking this maybe way I, from left field but i'm linking happiness um to truth okay and i heard something on npr recently um god yeah i know i sound so like no <laughs> but uh can we make that a soundboard thing from now on? Casey going, no. It, it's, it's public radio, dude. It's for the people. Uh, I heard on NPR, this. they did this study about why seniors are happier than any other age group. And it is because they have the experience of life behind them. So that they understand, basically, it's related to change. So seniors often will say things like, I fully understand that I won't have the same friends in 10 years. I'm fully aware of the fact that I probably won't be doing the same thing that I'm doing right now in 10 years. And so they're, the way that they plan their lives, the way that they experience the world comes from this rich place of understanding that time is limited. And they're, they have like all these other experiences. I'm relating that to truth and this conversation about experience. That when we have all of these experiences, when we are forced to look at a, a situation that invites us to think about our neighbor, that invites us to think about our community, um, what transforms in us is this ability to, to grow our own understanding of truth. Does that make sense? Right. Yeah. But I think that the only way that we can grow our understanding of truth is by exposing ourselves to other people's understanding of truth. Because right. I think that I think that what we're doing here and what we're talking about is this idea of uh, and I, I use this all the time and Rajiv you mentioned it a little bit before but like the posture in which we approach truth. And I think it's sometimes we use it as a tool to take away someone's agency to control them to heighten our own truth. Like here's a, here's a dumb example, but when your kids are young and, and I'm, I'm guilty of this. So I'll just, I'm, this is just a biographical story right now. I'm going to openly admit it. It's out there. Um, hopefully it doesn't come back in the therapy room 10 years from now with my kids. But when they're at a certain age, it was easy for me to use my truth of the experience to manipulate their behavior to continue to enhance what I wanted in the situation, right? So 
they wanted more cookies. It was easier for me to say, oh, they're all gone than to, <laughs> you know, go through the whole thing of like trying to because it was just easier for me to, to control to, to create a reality that I wanted for them. And I think that we do that sometimes, you know, we talked about, you know, uh, Nazism and all that kind of stuff. I think that's just a grander scale of that whole thing is that you're taking your lens to the truth and you want to form and mold the world to what you think it should be. And I think it does go back to because there's a lot of people that are manipulating people because they do think they are considering their neighbor. They are thinking about what's best for them. And I think that agency plays a huge part in that is are we contributing to the agency of someone else or are we taking it away for the sake of what we believe is a better truth for them and it's not always a negative thing there are people who are who are doing these things out of a place of honesty and they feel like they're they have other people's best interests in mind to not listen the road, to them the road to hell was built on good intentions yeah uh, kind of Mm -hmm. So I guess the question we need to ask ourselves is, does the outcome uh, outcome justify us taking away anyone's agency? Yeah. And I think that's it also leads to a question of moral truth, which we haven't really talked right. about. We sort of danced around, you know, what's true about the world reality and so on. But is there a right and a wrong? And uh, then how does agency I'll also play into that, right? Sounds like there needs to be a part two, the sequel. That, that uh, <laughs> this is just random and off the top. I, just to respond to that, uh, Zizek, who is this, like, Marxist philosopher, and he's the guy who always kind of, like, you know, like, touches his nose when he's talking, and he, he's, like, really eccentric. He does this take on this movie back in the day. There's, like, a left-wing movie in the 70s, I think, where a guy goes into an abandoned church, and he finds these glasses and when he puts them on he can see advertisements as they actually are have you have you ever seen that that movie or clips of it yeah he like puts on the glasses and he sees like the money and it says this is your god instead of it like just being money or he sees and there's this fight scene where he fights his best friend and it's completely odd and zizek's talking about it and he's like it's the weirdest thing. They have this nine minute fight scene between him and his best friend trying to put the glasses on. And he's like, put their damn glasses on. And then he like forces it. And there's this sense that like our own expansion of consciousness and our freedom sometimes is painful. And it comes to us not out of our own choosing. And sometimes maybe it can't come to us out of our own choosing. And then so I want to ask that moral question, like what what is right and wrong? And like, when is it okay to like force that on other people or invite other people into it or force it on ourselves or shit? Like there's so much in there that I want to like talk, especially Bonnie, like you bring that up. I just wonder like expanding consciousness and expanding truth. Is that something we should be about? Like with all kinds of tools, Jeff's talking about manipulation, like that fight, that struggle to like set things up to where, our consciousness expands, but well, we I need to take into we, we need to take into account whether they're ready to see that truth. Because exactly, <clears throat> otherwise sometimes they'll reject none it. None of us are, but right. sometimes none of us are. None of us were ready for the truth of the fact that there's other galaxies out there necessarily. Like right. It just it, it came to us in a different way, or like I, don't know. I, I think we're we're confusing uh, evangelism, you know, evangelizing truth with sort of living into it truth. And I, I wonder, I think one of the things that we struggle with in just about any context is is being authentic as we move from one context to another. And as we're processing and evolving and growing, and if we embrace that authenticity and we take it into the space with others, whether they're ready or not, that's available to them. And if people do that for us, that their authenticity is available to us to ask questions. And, and, you know, I, I feel really lucky that I have the four of you and, and others in my life that live authentically when they're in my presence that ask that, that sort of evokes questions from me. And then I learn from them. I'm not always ready. Sometimes I'm like, you know, I start dozing off because it's too much. I'm not, I'm not ready to take it in. But then there's other times I'm on the edge of the seat asking questions. I guess what I'm saying is I gave up. I gave up on evangelizing anyone. I gave up on changing anyone. It's like, and maybe I needed that because of the, the place I'm coming from and the location I'm coming from. But I almost want to like push to where you give me a reason to actually step into situations where people are being hurt 
They really are. Like, their their freedom is at stake. And I know that I'm not in there to save them. That's not my prerogative. But I just wonder about the moral question. Is there ever a time to do that? Well, yeah. I mean, there's justice, right? And and it yeah, sounds I mean, to me like you're talking more about justice. So if, if there's a car going to hit someone, I'm not going to ask them, are you okay with me helping you move out of the way? Like, I'll just dive in there and like, and, and, and do it, you know, step in. But when ideology is like literally destroying people, when is it okay for us to step into the road and be like, no, we're going to, we're going to have that conversation about your ideology. If it's a Nazi, we do it all the time. We're in the street. You know, that that's bull. That's bull crap. <laughs> like what you're saying is wrong. We, 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 we do that, that. And the question is where, where along the line do you – are you just being, like, narcissistic or or you're doing something that someone's not ready for? All those questions you're asking are bringing that up. Right. But, I mean, isn't it, isn't it most honoring of people's own being to actually engage with them in an authentic way where you tell your story from your perspective? But the other side of that is to be open to their story from their perspective and be right. willing to have – whatever you bring to the table changed right in front of you and right in front of your new friend. Unless it's killing people. Then in but, that sense, I'm not going to But then why listen. would you change it? But I'm You could still like, listen. I don't have to. No, there, there, you know what? And this is where I, I end up on like the really left Antifa side of things. Is like There are certain things we don't have to listen to as a society. Like when someone throws a rock at you, uh, a rock at you ideologically, I'm not advocating violence, but when someone throws a rock at you ideologically, Banksy's the one who said you're allowed to throw it back. And I think that like there are certain ideas that are dangerous. We've seen that in in the rise of the incel movement and um, right wing extremism. And I think that allowing spaces in our society for some of this stuff to be said, that's fine. I'm not asking the government to shut it down. But personally, from my body, like I think it's on some of us to shut that stuff sure. down. But protective measures are necessary. This is my opinion here. Protective measures are necessary at times, but they rarely, if ever, change minds. True. And the problem with that, too, is there are people who believe that your ideology is just as harmful. Oh, I'm I'm aware. So then who determines? I, I do. And I'll tell you why. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> because Because it's apples and oranges. It's like, oh, some people deserve... To be eradicated from this earth. That's a legitimate position to have. No, like that has, you know, the, the whole complex, the paradox of tolerance is, is utter bullcrap to me. Like saying like earnestness and having multiple conversation partners is important. And then on the other side saying, no, we should eradicate some people and some people are not worthy of even being here. Those things are not even in the same playing field. You know, like I, I, I refuse the equation of the left and the right. They're not the same thing. And I'm not saying I don't disagree with you, but that is not that is not the truth of a lot of people in this world. So right. that's that's right. Yeah. That's why I talk about the ideological battle. It's a it's a moral question. But uh, it, the moral question is whether or not you stay in it in in the fight and or I, I'm, I guess I'm trying to understand the root of the question because I favor staying in the conversation. I don't think everybody should stay in the conversation. I don't I don't think that's it's not, you know, it's not safe space for everybody right. to stay in the conversation or it's not the danger that it it enables or provides is just not worth it the sacrifice of staying in the conversation. But for those who can stay in the conversation, I think it's important to stay in the conversation because like Jeff said, that people actually hold these ideas as their convictions that they're willing to live and die by. And without folks engaging with those ideas and earnestness, then then can we all sort of evolve and develop together? And And, and I think we can. Like, I think that there's a... There's a way that process doesn't have to be just individual. And so I and it doesn't happen unless people are willing to break through the barrier that separates one idea from another and actually listen and engage and find out if there's common ground and use that common ground. But, yeah, I don't think it's appropriate or safe for everybody. And I think, again, it's about agency. Right. I mean, this is sort of what I was going back to earlier. Like the collective, the collection of knowledge gives you the experience to, to try on new things. As we grow in wisdom and knowledge and truth, um, we are unafraid of the future or any other things that we acquire because we have 
we have learned how to evolve, right? And I think the one of the most important things that we can do then, back to this thing about um, how does in, this impact my neighbor, is to take what we know and share it. Like, I think I have become more of an evangelical as a progressive person than I ever was as an evangelical. Me too. Because um, what I know is that all of this knowledge that I have acquired has the capacity to save people's lives. That's what and I wanted so, to hear. Mm-hmm. And and for me, um, I'm not worried about young people or others uh, going to hell, some eternal hell, when they are experiencing hell now, when racism and sexism and homophobia are wreaking havoc all over. Um, my responsibility is to show up as an informed person and speak to the people that I need to speak to and keep my my friends and the people that I love who cannot live in those conversations um, safe, right? So I need to be the one to show up and be the most informed in the room and to offer my truth and and speak to the things that I know Right. I know. And and I think going back to that question that we asked at the beginning of this part of the conversation is how do you know someone's ready to see a particular truth? They're willing to enter into the conversation. We know the posture in which someone's genuinely asking us questions and we're having a genuine conversation. And if not, then to use a biblical term, we just brush the dust off our feet and we we move forward. And we take we we you know we take off those proverbial lenses that you were talking about, which by the way is the movie They Live, John Carpenter's They Live. It's amazing. Everyone should see that movie. I love it so much. Can I be frank? It is a lonely place. I think the reason I gravitate so much and the reason I appreciated this conversation with Bonnie like a while ago about truth is that I feel like the more and more I've expanded and let go of my own like prerogative and have listened to other people and my my experience has expanded, there's almost like less conversation partners. Like, correct me if I'm wrong, Bonnie, or, or all of you. There's like less and less and less conversation partners. The world's huge. I think it's cute that Alan wants to equate himself as smart as Bonnie. That's cute. No, I, I mean like... <laughs> I'm not just I, 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 no. I mean like... There, okay, okay. Th- th- this is what it is. There is something that I have encountered other people who, who, are, who are on a similar journey as myself, and it has to do with an expanded consciousness compassion for everyone for some reason that's growing just as fast as as experience and and understanding and then also realizing that everyone is participating that you can learn anything from anyone at any moment and so there are tons of conversation partners and there are less it's the weirdest like paradox that i feel like i've entered into and i'm gonna shut up now because if i start to talk about my process and where i'm headed at it's a long conversation that just doesn't necessarily apply to a lot of people i don't know we can have it later, Alan. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> and let, me, let me ask a uh, clarifying question, because I think I hear and understand sure. what you're saying, Alan. But it, it's like there there comes a point, and, and, and there's a series of tipping points on this, on this, this particular journey, where you become uh, more often a, a, a person in a conversation where you're kind of thinking, and hopefully it, you know, it stays internally, where it's like, you know, yeah, I've been there, done that. Yeah, I've been there, done that. And and there's the soft encouragement. There's asking open-ended questions. And then the number of people that actually look at you and go, oh, yeah, been there, done that, and and are listening softly and asking you the open-ended questions to pull you forward, those people get fewer and fewer, The the you know— in correlation with the work that you've put into it. I haven't thought about it that way. I resist that because I was created to think very humbly, I guess, about my own experience. And who do you think you are to think you have more perspective than someone else? Like, that's a big part of my background, right? We're all the ones yelling at everyone on the subway. Who do you think you are? You think you're better than me? Like, that's my that's my inheritance. But may, maybe that's what it is. I don't know. I think that's that's true, Alan, but that's part of the developmental process is that, you know, we we change not not only do we change ourselves, but we change our communities, our conversation communities. And it doesn't mean that there aren't conversation partners out there. It's just that it's like, you know, maybe not out, not outgrow is not the word, but like you're, you're, it's, you're headed into a different direction. And so now there's a different community that will need to be gathered around you. And there, and the community is out there. 
You know, it's just like, how do you, when you've been raised in one particular community and now you need to shift into another community in order to keep on your own path, that's the part that can be really challenging. And so sometimes I think we do come to the conclusion that, uh, oh, uh, I have to leave something behind or I'm having to shift from one place to another and it's not available. It's available. It just means a a search, a quest, a, a new discovery. And I don't want it to to come off as being like in in, in terms of superiority. Maybe it's just right. different. No, just yeah. It, and I think too that it's important for us, like like when we see something differently than the community that we have uh, that we're in the process of leaving, that somehow we feel like everybody should all of a sudden kind of come to where we're at because now we have this new perspective, this new vision of what we see as truth or justice or morality. And because it, because I can see it and I came from where you all are at, how come you can't? Like, I think that that is a, that can be a posture. Of, and that's, and that means you haven't, you haven't, you're not really on that real path. I think for all of us who have gone down the path, all there is is compassion the other way around. Like that just is, there's, there's no feelings of, Hey, you can't see this. You're not where I'm at. Like all that has just like shed. It's good. Well, it's gone. I, I think me. that's a blanket statement. I think it's a bell curve because I still have moments where I'm like, I get that superiority complex where of I'm like, course. I'm, yeah. I'm evolved. I see that. And I think that's a real reality and a real struggle as we move forward in this kind of thing. I, I think there's a lot here that we need <laughs> to still, <laughs> I want to talk for like to still unpack to and hear what you think. Uh. So I think what we'll do with all this is we'll give our final thoughts and then we are committing right now. So for those of you who are listening, the very next episode that we have, we'll take this truth, this ambiguous idea of truth, and then we're going to narrow it, narrow the focus of our conversation into moral truth. So our next episode, we've never really announced an episode ahead of time unless we've done a series. So next episode, we're going to be talking about moral truth, right and wrong, our our actions in the world, and can we determine whether that is? Because I, I would... Maybe this is a spoiler. I would like to talk about relativism more because I think that for all of us, that was presented as like the anti-truth. And I think that that's more connected with morality. And uh, so next week's drinking game will, as we're talking about moral truth and relativity, next week's drinking game will be how many times we mention Hitler uh, because that will, <laughs> that will always be in the conversation. So final thoughts. And then we'll we'll move into our our segment for for this uh, week. So so Casey, let's let's start with you. I, I want to hear from you. Yeah, I uh, I am just in this place of hearing um, John Lennon in my head singing. You know, imagine 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 a world does that is not defined by religion. Imagine a world where we can see each other uh, clearly. I think that 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 only happens when we can acknowledge that that truth is informed by the people around us that we do not hold it solely but we need each other and we are we are transformed by each other's experiences and we have the capacity to learn and grow we always have the capacity to do that i'm thinking of people who are listening and being all over the place on their journey i love that we have friends who are who are all over the roadmap and I guess my encouragement would just be that it's always worth it to be earnest, to not give in to cynicism and dissolution that nothing matters, uh, maybe for a time, but it is worth it to show up and to be honest in your exploration. And uh, the process of truth of meeting with other people and, and creating those things that give us breath or put the concrete steps below us to do really beautiful things, I think it's worth it. I, I I feel the need to quote Emily Dickinson in Yay! <laughs> these closing <laughs> words. She wrote some verse, and it uh, it begins, you know, tell all the truth, but tell it slant. And then at the closing line of that same verse is, um, "The truth must dazzle gradually, or every man be blind." I feel preached to. Oh, so great. Yeah, Bonnie, you should have gone last because now I'm like, I, I know. How do you follow <laughs> what the... Bonnie and Emily Dickinson? That's messed up. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's all well, yeah. the 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 relationship between truth, belief, and facts, I think, are is an important 
kind of coexisting dynamic uh, to, to think about. And and if you ever watch some of those murder shows, you know, those crime shows, there's like a belief you walk in with about the characters, right? Like, oh, I believe this or I think that. Uh, and then the facts begin to evolve. The truth begins to evolve. And then the belief about who's who and what's what changes. So I, I think recognizing our own responsibility to the pursuit of truth and deeper understanding is is critical. We cannot abdicate those responsibilities to other people. Uh, we have to be in relationship with folks and and do the work because it's necessary. And and as Alan and Casey have pointed out a couple of times in different ways, it can and often is a life and death matter either in the immediate or in distance. So if only there was a place where we could hear open-ended conversations where people give us questions to explore and we can, we can evaluate these questions on our own time oh, and perhaps God. at the end of these conversations invited to join the conversation ourselves in some way, shape, or form. Maybe we'll figure that out one day. Uh, <laughs> are, are you auditioning for the next iteration of the Twilight Zone? <laughs> no, I think he's promoting the show notes. Like, oh, oh. Go I to am. the website, leave a comment, <laughs> let's chat. Give us all of your resources on truth. Give us your YouTube videos that you want us to watch. Stuff like that. That's right. Well, because I think, I th honestly, I think there is some, there is some truth to what you were saying, Alan. Is that is that when we get to these places, depending upon our context, it's yeah. hard to feel like there's anyone that's like minded like us. Mm -hmm. And I think that's an yeah. important thing as we're journeying through our truth is to know that we're not alone in it. And, um, that is, I think that is our hope for the show. It's the hope why we do all these conversations and why we have everything. So, um, and especially now where I think many of us, you know, depending upon when this comes out and how the, the world has progressed with, there's going to be a lot more isolation. There's going to be a lot more of mm -hmm. us sitting and listening and, and consuming and it's, it's going to be difficult. So our hope is that conversations like these is giving people comfort to know that there, there, there is a safe space. It's a virtual space and it's not the same, but it's, it's something. Yeah. So there's, there are multiple ways to, to interact with us or, you know, other shows, you know, use this opportunity to, to explore other, other podcasts, I guess. Um, you no, know, don't, don't do that. <laughs> uh, what? so, so to close out this particular conversation, you really can add your voice to this conversation. Uh, you can check out our show notes. You can comment on the show notes at irencast.com slash 165. And also you can uh, email us at podcast at irencast.com to suggest possible future topics for the show. Or, you know, just share with us your story and how important uh, these and other conversations have been for you. So that, that email again, podcast at irencast.com. Uh, so on the other side of the music, we're going to shake everything off and play a little game called two truths and a lie all right we are officially on the other side of the music and given the topic of our conversation this week, we are going to be playing a classic, I would assume for most people, called Two Truths and a Lie. So how this works, if you're not familiar, is each of us are going to say three things about ourselves. And this is, I feel like the window of this game is going to close because we're going to know each other more and more and be able to tell everything. But uh, each of us is going to say three things about ourselves, two of which will be true, and the third one will be a lie. And it is the the job of the other co-hosts to determine which one they think is the lie. And Alan's going to keep score because that's what he does. And <laughs> <laughs> I can't help it. I ruin all of my relationships with my competitive nature. It, we we'll see if that's true if he's on next week's episode. All right. Um. <laughs> everyone, everyone who is sitting at home who just heard Alan say that, just take a shot just for that. Like, just take a shot for Alan. Thank you. All right, so who would like to start this exercise of deception? Score pad ready. I'll go. Okay, Casey. So uh, I have met John Kerry, Rob Bell, and Lizzo. The lie is Rob Bell. You've never met John Kerry. I'm I'm going to go with Rajiv. I think I think Rob Bell is the 
the answer as well. Um, me too. I'm going to say Rob Bell too. I sadly have never met Lizzo. Oh. Oh. What? I Last... thought you, you were, you were no. really oh. tricky. That was Not good. good. So I uh, was a grand marshal. I was a grand marshal last summer for Sacramento Pride Parade. And I literally was like five feet away from her. But she was in the trailer. She was like in getting ready to get on and perform. Basically, everyone was like, get off the stage because they were ready to have Lizzo. Right. And if I would have just stuck around for like three more seconds, I would have met her. But sadly, I didn't. And and she went. She went big like two weeks later. That's right. That is yeah, like, exactly just, right. You know, just, yeah. Her just tiny desk. Her d- tiny desk c- concert is one of the best ones that Tiny Desk has ever had. Totally worth watching. That that was good, Casey. Good that stuff, was man. The Pride yeah. thing threw me off because that was in my mind. I was like, oh no, she was at Pride. He totally right. met her. That's right. And then I figured See, John. I feel. I figured John Kerry was like a weird out there kind of enough of a pick where I was like, okay, he probably met. And then Rob Bell seemed like the obvious pick that you did meet him. So that's why I said Rob Bell. Can that we was... reframe this for a second? Lizzo has never met you. Oh, that's really right. Oh. I, so I actually have a video. I actually have a video of Rob Bell calling me his best friend, and I feel like we should post it on. We should post it somewhere, and that would be totally. Yeah. We should post that because it says everyone should listen to Casey. So that is hilarious, and it would be worth sharing. I think that is should be put on a T-shirt. Rob Bell in quotes. Everyone should listen to Casey. <laughs> yeah, for real. <laughs> That might not have some weight with a lot of our listeners. No, nobody scored a point. Nobody scored a point on that one. Unfortunately. I'll I'll go next, but I don't know if if Bonnie can play this one. I don't know. I can just stay out of it. You You know what? No, no, you could you you could do it. You have a rich inner life that, you know, isn't known by everyone. So that's true. Plum the depths for something. Okay, that's true. All right. I have been naked in a pickup truck. (laughs) <laughs> so, Every, i like the way this is starting we play with the oh my god i have never been to a clown college i have a dent in my forehead <laughs> i'm gonna say the naked in the pickup truck thing i'm for sure he has done that i i could almost guarantee that so I'm going to say uh, that you have never been to a clown college. I, is it weird to say that I was secretly hoping that there would be a naked thread through all of your things? Like I've been naked here, <laughs> here, yeah, here. I was too. I seriously was <laughs> uh, What's your guess, Jeff? Uh, okay, so it was naked in a pickup truck. Uh, the clown college. What was the oh d- dent in your forehead? Ne- never been to a clown college. So I've been naked in a pickup truck. Never been to a clown college. And have a dent in my forehead. Man, this is a good one because all of those seem super random. I feel like if if you haven't been naked in a pickup truck, there's something wrong with you. Like anybody, just in general. <laughs> that should be like a... Like or, a... or Bonnie, depending upon how your relationship is. <laughs> uh, I, I'm going to go with the dent in the forehead just because I want those other things to be very true. <laughs> yeah. Bonnie, can you play this one or no? I don't think I should play this one. Tell us the answer, Bonnie. What? Wait. Well, you, are you, you not going to play because you might Bonnie get it could wrong. go last. She could go last. <laughs> so go What's ahead, the Alan. Did you go, Alan? Already? Yeah. Oh, you did. All right, go ahead, Make Bonnie. Pickup truck. Um, never been to a clown college. Ooh, did she get it wrong? She got it wrong. Yay! I have never been to a clown college. That's true. Oh, yeah. Oh. That's true. I have a dent in my forehead. That's true. Yeah. I. It's a regret. I've never been naked in a pickup <laughs> it's truck. It's a regret. <laughs> okay. It seems Wait. like something I would have done, right? I only right. got one point. That's right. Yeah. I so, think yeah, we'll yeah, have yeah. to talk more about this later. <laughs> Whoa. That doesn't mean I was <laughs> perhaps I'm in a pickup saying... truck. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. I didn't say automobile. Here, we'll put a, we'll put a star by that point so that Bonnie can dispute it later. <laughs> or make it a reality, whichever one you choose. <laughs> this is why 
truth is so elusive because <laughs> memories change, right? Uh huh. Wait a minute. Are 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 you disputing, Bonnie, that he has indeed been <laughs> naked in a right pickup truck? Would you say, wait a minute? A pickup truck? <laughs> no. Automobile, yes. Pickup truck. No. So where in the pickup truck exactly? Like in the cab or in the back? Would you prefer to be naked? Well, the back would be the place to be naked. Right. Absolutely. Now, he's in the bed. Under the yeah. stars. Driving? Totes. Yeah. Like through town? <laughs> driving. I think driving the <laughs> cowboy hat, Richie, if I could that see would that. Be, that would be fun. That would be fun. Oh, Just make God. sure you have something to uh, brace yourself. All right. Everyone follow Rajiv on Instagram story. You never know. <laughs> yes. He's also really active on Twitter. Just just a little small plug. Rajiv is active on Twitter. Soon to be very active. <laughs> Good. Hmm. All right. Clever ways to increase your followers. <laughs> Can I go next? You may. Yes, please. All right. Uh, I once put a snowball in the freezer, took it out in the summer, and threw it at my brother. Uh, I once, or I, there's just this last week, I bought curtains, and I saw a cigar-shaped UFO in the backyard in 2009. The date specific ones are kind of difficult because the date becomes part of the truth or the lie. Mm-hmm. So take that into a consideration. I'm going to say uh, curtains. I'm 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 I don't believe the curtain story. Yeah, I'm going to go with that one as well, because you procrastinate on things that are important to you for the sake of others. I think it's the UFO in 2009. Yeah, I think it's the UFO because the shape is different than a cigar. I think Rajiv, the Rajiv date's nailed different. It. <laughs> it oh, really? The shape that was different. The shape. So I did put a snowball in the freezer. Uh, I did buy curtains this week, but only because I had people who cared about me who forced me to do something for myself, Jeff. So that was pretty. I was close. You got half of truth. I was Jeff, close. You know, he told it slant, uh, but it was actually the shape. Yeah. I have never but said this I on still our podcast. Got, I still get a point, Alan. Yeah, you, you get you one point. Get I get point. two points. <laughs> I get two points because I got the thing Bonnie. and I got the reason it was wrong. So that's a double pointer. I've never said this in public and I've never said it on the podcast, but I did see a UFO in 2009. This with is a not helping when I, this, I these Twitter people. This <laughs> is know. not helping hang the on, Twitter hang people. On. I just have to say it was a classic disc shape and it was so... It was stupid. It looked like a movie prop. It was the dumbest thing ever. And it like flew in, broke the laws of physics, hovered for a while and flew off. And the first thing I did was like, no. And I pointed at the sky. I was like, that is so dumb. That's the dumbest thing I've ever seen. And then uh, just recently I found out other people have had similar experiences, like way back when. Um, Who's that movie director who, when he was a kid, oh, I forgot his name, but he said the same thing. He, he went on saying it looked like a movie prop. It looks really dumb. So I have no idea what it was. I'm not saying I'm a believer in aliens or anything, but but you are. I saw I saw a flying saucer. We have a whole episode, and, Alan, that says that you are a believer in aliens. No, I said we're going to discover aliens oh, at some okay. point. I didn't come out and say that episode, but yeah. So if you want to talk about UFOs, uh, come talk to me. And the reason I've never talked about it publicly is it destroys my credibility as a minister. <laughs> so let's put it on no a podcast for everyone it. to hear. <laughs> what? So let's put it on a podcast for everyone to hear. Yeah, I, mean, I have no shame anymore. That, I mean, that, like, that's the thing that okay, <laughs> <laughs> that's the thing that destroys my credibility. <laughs> oh my god, <laughs> oh, that was so funny. Ooh, All right, dropping truths on the episode. Bonnie, how about you? Okay, it's out there. All right, so first one, I um, didn't have a color TV until I got married. I fell off the roof of my house. I bought my sister a snake for being my maid of honor at my wedding. <laughs> hmm. All those are very believable. Are we allowed to ask qualifying <laughs> questions for these? No. no. Oh. You gotta I'm take gonna, one. I'm gonna go with the television. Me too. I think that's the lie. That hurts my heart. I don't want to go with that one. No, I, no, I think she's I, I think that's the truth. Wait a minute. What am I playing? Two truths and a lie? Where's the yeah, lie? What's the lie? Oh, yeah, yeah. What's oh, the yeah. lie? Oh, the lie. Oh, they're all so true, though. I think you bought your sister a different reptile. So that's that's what I'm going to say is the lie. 
Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna say the lie is the TV as well because I don't want that to be true, Bonnie. I don't. I want. I want. I want what's best for you. All right, I'm gonna guess. It, it's the roof. Is my guess. <laughs> I think it was your sister that fell off the roof. Um. Actually, my parents bought a color TV like. As I was moving out of my house, so we I missed the color TV. I did have a color TV in my the home that I lived in, um, like maybe eight months before I got married. So that was the lie. Casey, when did we got you it. fall off a roof? I was like fifteen or something at Rio. Oh. Hmm. What kind of snake? Boa constrictor. No, That's actually, so no. Cool. A uh, ball python. A ball python. Ball python. Ball python. Boa constrictor. Yeah. You know what's funny is I heard ball python in my head when you said boa constrictor. Interesting. <laughs> That's what I meant. Okay, so Jeff gets a point. Casey gets a point. Who's winning, Alan? We're all tied. <laughs> <laughs> you put me down for two, right? Uh, you got one, and nah. See, that dude. That's a tiebreaker. If if there's, so I'm in the lead. All right. If there's a tiebreaker, <laughs> you did specify. All right, here it is. This is for the win. Well, that sucks. I'm out of the running then, because I can't guess on my own. Hmm. But your lie is powerful enough to decide. But the winner. you could be you could be the spoiler. So now I know I need. To, I'm, I'm, maybe I should recraft so I can pick who I want to win based <laughs> off of my <laughs> manipulation of what I know of each of you. Um, I can't take any more depth psychology today. Okay, you got to go with what you came in with, man. That's true. It's true. That's All right. what he said. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Isolation setting it already, guys. I said I said these episodes to my church. You do realize that. Right? <laughs> well, you great. believe in aliens, your credibility shot. I know. I didn't say <laughs> aliens. I said I saw a flying saucer. There's a really big difference. Oh yeah, they're gosh. both equally believable. All right. Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, this is always hard for me because no, because I don't. I really don't want Alan to win, and he knows me pretty well. And yeah, we we've known each other since I was 18, and it's been we, do a know, preference thing, Jeff. Do a preference so thing. Much. Well, I'll, I'll know. Go go at specific dates and colors. <laughs> I'm a, I'm a, I was a very invasive brother-in-law, so I would ask lots of questions all the time. Really, that that doesn't surprise me at all. Yeah, right, I, nobody is shocked. <laughs> it is very true. Um, all right. When I was a child, when I grew up, I wanted to be a football player. I'm really into Christina Aguilera. And when I was an adolescent, I sent a love letter to a girl in the mail before I had email admitting that I liked her because I liked her. I'm pretty sure I heard you say at one point uh, that you have always hated sports. So I'm going to assume that you it was that you the lie is that you did not want to be a football player. That's, that's, I don't know, when you were a kid. That one's not adding up for me either, but it, but neither is Christina Aguilera. Because you, you, you like have these really obscure tastes. <laughs> and, uh, that might be one of them. But, well, but it's not a movie. And, and you have kids who, and Christina's awesome. So I, I'm so conflicted, Jeff. The love letter thing just seems like, no, he didn't do that. But then again, If you were a football aspiring person, I don't know. I'm so confused, Jeff. I'm going to go with Casey, though. I'm going to go with the football one. I'm going to say Christina Aguilera is the lie. Okay, I would like to to get... So this is my thought, Jeff. I could be wrong. I think you did want to be a football a football player when you were younger for a brief period of time. Uh, I was going to say Christina Aguilera because, you know, you're changing it from Alanis Morissette to Christina Aguilera or something. You made some kind of change, but I think you probably do like her. I think you sent uh, a message to a girl that you liked her over a pager and not <laughs> over a letter <laughs> in the mail. Pager? You, had, you, you can't pager, use pagers right? like that. You can use pagers for, like, little <laughs> codes. Yeah, like, I love you. <laughs> Meet me, you know, things like that. Meet me. I don't know. Meet me. 
<laughs> First of all, Alan. That's what he said. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, there's so much to unpack there. There I is not have there's this game so much you. to unpack. But the main thing I want to say is, damn it, you're correct. Not the yeah. pager part. Oh. Oh. But that, yeah. that was the lie. I would never admit to someone how I feel about that. That's right. what I was thinking. Right. I was like, oh, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, there's no way. And when I was a kid, I watched, my grandmother watched football, and I watched with her every weekend, and her favorite team was the Raiders, and I liked baseball at the time, too, and Bo Jackson was like the coolest yeah. thing in the world to me, yep. so I wanted to be a football Bonos. player. And Christina Aguilera is delightful, and I will listen to her sing any second of any day and uh i'm not gonna apologize for that at all <laughs> she might be my favorite pop star i don't know that's wow. great we'll see aren't you divulging too many feelings <laughs> i i can edit this i'm the editor i can do whatever i want <laughs> and then you and guys did can... you ever send a page or a page message to someone you liked no no oh, that's on. that's not safe i would never I would never. You, have code. you said you had codes and stuff. Oh, oh yeah. I, I mean, I'll, I, stop, I'll stop talking. When I, I when, I, when I was information for when I was dating someone, when I was dating my wife, I would send her the the one four three, of course. But <laughs> that's so cute. But the I would never take the risk three. of. I told you. See, you did send that over. You did send right. A but I would. But I never would have taken the risk of like doing a that letter. to someone or, or some sort of message to someone that I wasn't sure actually liked me i never made the move until i knew 100 percent. and that's just now that was too much information that's <laughs> mark for, for Looking cut at your face, I could tell. mark uh, for cut yeah. uh i i had a pager but i don't know what 143 is i love you <laughs> i love you because love has four letters in it you has three letters in it i has one uh, one four three you never did the the one four three you know, once he rides naked in a pickup, then maybe he'll get in touch with that part of himself. It'll all come back to me. <laughs> all, <laughs> all right. That's that's it for this week. That's the true two truths and a lie. Um, that was fun. And surprise, surprise, yeah. the scorekeeper wins. Oh, uh, yeah, I guess that's true. I tried so hard. Honestly, you guys, that was like an audience of one. The reason I was struggling is because I did not want Alan to win. And it did not work. And I'm... Mortified. I apologize to everyone listening that was Invasive rooting. Invasive love conquers all. It's true. That's... All right. Well, with that all being said, that'll do it for us this week. If you enjoy Irenacast and you would like to join the work that we are doing, please consider donating to our PayPal link at irenacast.com slash PayPal. Uh, we're committed to keeping the show for free for listeners, but there are costs involved and your financial support would be helpful. That's irenacast.com slash PayPal. We're also a nonprofit organization, so all donations are tax deductible. And a big thank you to our brand new anonymous donor who's already taken advantage of our PayPal link, who is donating in honor of a new listener, Amy B from Minneapolis, Minnesota. So thank you, anonymous donator for your donation. And thank you, Amy B for being a new listener. For more information on ways to partner with the show, please go to irenacast.com slash support. Uh, some of those ways include our Amazon affiliate link and, of course, our merch. You can also support the show by simply making sure that you've subscribed on whatever uh, app you listen on. And if the platform allows it, leave a rating and or review. We always appreciate hearing from you. So for this week, I'm Jeff. I'm Alan. I'm Bonnie. I'm Casey. And this is Rajiv. Thanks for joining the conversation. Are we stopping?